Hi, this is Dr. Carl Goldcamp. If you're interested in learning about the ketogenic diet like I was to save my own life, then this is probably the podcast for you. Eight years ago, I knew nothing about it. Six years ago, it saved my life. Three years ago, I started researching and talking with some of the authorities in the field and attending medical conferences about this to understand why and how keto so dramatically changed my and my wife's Judy's lives. The purpose of this podcast is to share our journey of discoveries with you in understanding how keto is so effective in improving so many different conditions, from obesity, epilepsy, diabetes, infertility, MS, Alzheimer's, heart disease, to name a few. So take a step away from all the hype you've probably heard and roll up your sleeves with me and join me weekly to explore this living miracle that anyone can access. We'll talk science, we'll talk food. We'll explore its history and evolution to today, which is that the sheer wonder of the ketogenic way of eating has changed untold number of lives, unlike anything before it. And in case I forget to mention it, please join our Facebook group, Keto Naturopath. Hi, welcome back to the next episode of the Keto Naturopath, and Happy New Year, everyone. This is now January of 2021. So the very first podcast for 2021 for me, I'd like to make as a partial apology to uh, a woman out there. And here's the apology part. Uh, She had sent me an email, a nice long email with good information, and I was very interested in it. But it happened to be at a time in which I was just about to go away to a week, kind of to a, a business conference. And then when we were to come back, we had to begin moving. For some reason, the email got lost. I went back to look for it. I figured out what day I had received it. I just couldn't find it again. And it was about lipedema, which is what today's podcast is going to be about. So what I thought I would do, since I can't even identify who had sent in the email, is cover this topic again. I did it before more thoroughly, but also cover it as if I was going over a treatment plan for someone with lipedema. And I will show you where I disagree and my approach is, and by the way, my approach is, um, I don't believe anything I do is entirely unique. It is not about me. I don't have the magic sauce. I just put pieces together and I I believe I'm more thorough than most people I've seen, whether they're MDs or naturopathic doctors. I don't know if I'd say eclectic. My training is obviously as a naturopathic doctor from Bastyr, graduated in 98. Shh, quiet, don't tell anybody that. And acupuncture, Chinese herbal medicine, and environmental medicine. To me, they were vital. And I had it in my naturopathic component, I was strong botanical medicine component to the point that I worked at Gaia Farms way back in the day, You probably before anybody knew about it. I spent a summer wildcrafting out in the Waldron Island in the Pacific Northwest with Ryan Drum. So that was my background where I come from. It's pretty holistic to say the least. So now, if you are a woman, and let's say you're in your mid-40s to 50s or 60s, and you're looking to make a change in your life because you've been diagnosed now, let's say, for 10 to 20 years with lymphedema, not lymphadenopathy or not lymphedema. One is about lymph, and they do kind of cross over if lipedema, as in lipids, gets to be so large, then you induce other conditions. But for the most part, we are going to be talking about lipedema, not lymphedema. And so my approach and why I think my approach is probably the best approach out there. And I'm sure there's other people doing something similar. I don't know them. And it's not that I'm trying to ignore them. It's just that I know it works. I know what I look look for. And when you have 20 years of experience behind you, some of this just comes easily. I mean, experience does count for something, folks. So, and yes, a corner of this does involve the ketogenic diet, and that's why it's on this podcast. Okay, so you're a woman, we'll say 50. You are, let's say, stage three lymphedema, which is fairly heavy. For people who don't know about lymphedema, I quickly will ask you to think of elephantitis, uh, which is just a very heavy hyper fat limbs. Primarily it's the legs and the buttocks. Sometimes it's the upper arms and uh, it doesn't get to the hands and feet, but it gets to the limbs thereof, not in the forearms so much. So I'm going to go over what we know of it. We're going to go over the 
quote unquote, what they think the causes are. And nobody really knows. So spoiler alert on that. So therefore you have to look with a broad spotlight of things that affect one's immune system and one's ability or dysregulated ability of uh, producing fat cells. I believe it all comes together. And I believe when you come down to a very narrow cause, you can start treating some of these things. So I'll start with the biggest disagreement when people come to listen to a podcast like this, a keto naturopath, it's all going to be on keto and how wonderful keto is. Keto is very wonderful and it is a very core of my life. And it was very vital to my health and is to my health today. However, if you're coming listening here to look for that one thing that you can do that's going to change your life, it doesn't work that way. I think that most keto people, unfortunately, try to sell you like, this is a thing to do and it will completely change your life. This one thing. Well, that's never been the case. You didn't get to have a medical condition because of just one thing, unless you had some sort of genetic flaw that was obvious from birth. And that's a whole different category. Most of it has to do with environment, which is what you ate, what you breathed, what you absorbed, what you're exposed to, and coupled with your genes. And when I say genes, I speak of genome, and then we get into, and we will today, some genomic work. And I'm simply coming from my experience, not exclusively with lipedema. I have very few, and it's only been passing that I've had in this last five years or so, a few people that I've talked with about and suggested some things they could try, but I have not had a long treatment scheme with one person for lipedema. But I'm going to go over what I would do, and I think it would be very effective. So keto is very effective. Let me give you this analogy. If you could visualize a bucket, and if you could visualize some rocks in the bucket, a big rock, some smaller rocks, some pebbles, and some sand. So all of this bucket, as you pick it up with a handle, you go, oh, it's kind of a hefty, hefty weight. All of that is going to represent the weight on your immune system, or you might say the obstacles for you living a healthy life. We call it one of the um, seven truths in the Hippocratic Oath that at least the naturopathic physician's oath version of this takes is obstacle to cure and removing the obstacle to cure. So that presumes that you can identify the obstacle, and then it also presumes that you can remove the obstacle. Both of those may or may not be true on various conditions. But the step to look for what are some contributing factors, to put it in, what are the biggest contributing factors? So I see that bucket as not only a, an accumulative weight on your immune system. So one bucket for one person may manifest in a certain condition. And for one heavy bucket, you might say, of this mix that I've told you about, might manifest in a different condition for another person, because they do have enough genomic differences that they will respond differently. And they've, each of us, were not born by the same mother with the same condition. So there's enough variations. Obviously, we're humans and we have more in common, way more in common than we have differences. But however, What we found, and I'm certainly speaking of my truth as a physician, is each person is different. And if you just slap in a, oh, lipedema protocol, boom, and if that lipedema protocol is a ketogenic diet, you'll probably get X percent of improvement to those people who have never tried it before. And I would say that that would probably be pretty low, probably right 5 or 10%. But if you're talking to one of those 5 or 10%, they're going to think it's a miracle. They went on the ketogenic diet whatever that means to them. And they're going to say, wow, they're going to be the poster child. They're going to be screaming around it around the earth to all the other people, women primarily that have lipedema. Men also get it, but hardly much at all. So that's what I'm asking you is to visualize this bucket. So where does the ketogenic diet? And when I say the diet, classic ketogenic diet, we're going to be looking at 20 grams of carbs per day or less. And then we can slide away to ketovore or carnivore or however you want to go, but I'll tell you what I would do. So this is about me and my advice that you will get from me if you are my patient. 
and I'm not looking for you to be my patient. I'm this is my apology to this one woman who wrote this great email that I can't get back to, okay? And then I think it will benefit other people. I want to review because there are some really interesting things. When so lipedema I've described to you, there's four stages, and you can gradually see it's heavier, heavier, heavier. And I don't need to go through the different stages. It gets to be more, basically a more advanced pathogenicity. And you can guess that. That means your inflammatory markers are going to be higher and higher. And a lot of things that were present initially will just be larger numbers and or get more complex. But primarily, it's bigger. It's heavier. It's more awkward. It's more unsightly. And it's more problematic for the person. So I am looking at, and I wanted to review a number of different websites that I think are pretty decent to give you a, a good summary. And so the one I'm looking at now is called uh, Lymphatic Education and Research Network. And this is their coverage of lipedema. I'm not going over the whole thing. I'm just simply going over what triggers lipedema. I think they this is agreed upon. This isn't unique to this site, but it's agreed upon. And it's interesting. And I'll tell you why it's interesting. The times in which lymphedema have been noticed to start in these various women is puberty, pregnancy, that is when they got pregnant, obviously, perimenopause and menopause, that's pretty much the same time, and gynecological surgery or trauma. Gynecological surgery or trauma, you could say it has more to do with female hormones. Okay, so why is that interesting? Well, now looking from an environmental medical perspective, which is a perspective of when contaminants are most likely to be disrupting to normal human life, it is at, first of all, it's in utero, of course, when you're still being formed in your mother's womb. But after that, it's puberty. And so puberty is the beginning of secondary growth characteristics, right? The beard, the pubic hair, the hair under the arms, and women, men are Prank say pretty straight self-explanatory, but it's suddenly a shift of hormones, okay? So it's a shift of hormones that happens in puberty, a shift of hormones that happens in pregnancy, a shift of hormones, and they all happen differently, by the way. I'm just saying it's a time of, of tremendous shifting of hormones that result in how tissue growth one way or the other. The shifting of hormones in perimenopause, menopause, and gynecological, we can guess that's probably... A hysterectomy, uva hysterectomy, and so therefore it's another shift. This is times in which they find that if one is exposed to pesticides, herbicides, heavy metals, that they will be, these are very vulnerable times. So these are key points of hormonal change in a woman's life, also key times. So puberty of men and women are equally vulnerable. Pregnancy, obviously, only to women. Perimenopause, men go through a kind of menopause, if you will. It's not obviously as pronounced. Um, it's a little more subtle, but there is also a time there as well. So these are unique times. So let's talk a little more about hormones. When I talk about our program, I talk about, we look at, we do a big metabolic panel, right? So that's your, it's blood workup for lack of a better. I'm not going to get too technical. Some people love the technical. Some people get lost as soon as I open my mouth and start mentioning tests. But we do basic CBC lipid panel we go deeper, homocysteine, certainly inflammatory markers. We look at thyroid, free T, you know, and I'll just say thyroid. If anybody's interested, I'll go more deeply into that, the specific thyroid tests. Um, and a lipid panel, I think I already said that, lipid panel and liver panel. And as I'm looking now, we look at IGF, which is really interesting. Insulin-like growth hormone and vitamin D vitamin B12. We look at your omega-3 ratio. So we do a, an omega-3 panel, an omega panel actually, and, and carnitine on and on. Of course, we look at insulin and, and we look at insulin and glucagon and, and glucose, of course. Those are fasting numbers. So what do I get out of this and why would I do that? What am I looking for? I'm looking for things that are pretty out of range either way under or way over, and that have certain sort of correlations. I'm looking for relationships, and I'm looking for something to approach. And if this person who's sitting in front of me, you, let's say, and you have given me your diet diary, it would be required, your seven day of what you actually eat in the normal week of the life of you, 
So now I get to I get to visualize. I might even, you know, tell you online to go on chronometer and put in all your food. I probably wouldn't do that because it's a learning curve with chronometer. And if you're just giving me your rough data, I would just say seven days, everything you've eaten, no, just have a normal week. I need to see how you live. Okay, then. So I'm looking for things that are just out of range. I'm not zeroing in on insulin resistance, but that might be a contributing factor. I'm not looking in on low vitamin D. I'm not looking in on inflammatory markers. But by having this pretty large perspective to look at, it gives me some clues. So do I see a lipedema profile in such a large metabolic panel? Well, and it's still, it's a variation. You bet there's going to be inflammatory markers. Uh, there may or may not be a homocysteine thing to be involved with. You know, that would, we'll get into that on the genomic aspect, but that would be really interesting to look at. IGF. So IGF is what I've learned by doing IGF over the last couple of years in these groups is that I can spot now on this one test who is a dairy consumer in their normal life, in their before meeting Dr. Carl life. And who is not? And by the way, when people work with me, yeah, they're going to have to drop dairy for two months and then they can go back and do whatever they want to do. But I want to see a before and after. It's a contributing factor because hormones do come in on dairy. And when I say dairy, I don't mean your cow, Bessie, in the backyard that you go out and milk every day who is not on antibiotics and who is not on growth hormones. That is an image of milking cow milkers of 100 plus years ago. That doesn't happen in this country any more to 99.9% of us. So the dairy that we get that comes from a commercial cow is full of hormones. It may or may not be pregnant as well as lactating, therefore being high on estrogen. It may or may not be high on growth hormones. It probably will be high on IGF. IGF for cows is the same IGF as for humans. Isn't that interesting? So when we drink the IGF, that comes through milk to humans, it amplifies our own production of IGF. High levels of IGF have to be fairly high or associated with various cancer, but it's a pro-growth. It's what they call a proxy for growth hormone. Growth hormone is expensive and hard to get, and it has a shorter half-life, and why bother? So they use this, and I'm good with that. But you look at things. What if this person, what if somebody in lipedema came in and they did have low vitamin D. Well, that would be one thing that you could address. And what if they had a ratio of omega-3s? So you have, there's a panel and uh, let me scoot to the panel to tell you what you get exactly. So on the omega-3 panel, you get an omega-6 to 3 ratio, which is probably the most important of this little small panel. And what you're looking for is a ratio of three being omega-6s to one omega-3s. We're not looking for one to one. And so we're looking for something reasonable. Most people come in at 20 to 1. That's hugely tilted in the side of omega-6. So that's something that can be addressed. In the very least, it can be addressed in a moderate way by taking good fish oil supplements. Better would be to shift them over to having incorporating more fish in their diet. Salmon would be great. Sardines and mackerel fillets would be great. You would not have them do tuna. You would not have them do swordfish because they're heavy and high in heavy metals, mercury primarily. So there's a way you can address that. Why would we address that? That in itself is an inflammatory context, an inflammatory marker, you might say, a high omega-6-3. So that's one thing. We'd also look at in that panel, the omega-3 panels, we have your EPA versus DHA. And most of you already know those are fish oils. So we look at those ratios. So that's something. You couple that together with your homocysteine, your vitamin D, glucagon. Now that would be, when we have people come in, I don't have enough lipedema patients to say, or people have been through the program, to say that across the board, all lipedema women have low glucagon. So glucagon, you remember, is the opposite of insulin. We'll leave it that simply. But glucagon is the thing that that's your ability. When glucagon is up, you are making your own glucose from your liver, from your glycogen stores in your liver. So gluconeogenesis. 
gluco being glucose, neo being new, genesis being to make, right? Gluconeogenesis. So you're making your own glucose. Usually what happens, and this is my theory, and given another 100 patients, I bet I can prove it. Um, and this is what I'm seeing so far in other people, is that people who are very heavy, now I'm speaking of obesity and diabetes, but people who are very heavy have all come in with low glucagon levels. Those that have been most low, now we're talking, so a range is 50 to 150. That's the normal range, quote, fasting, normal fasting range. So you do it with glucose and insulin and all this other stuff. Every so often, you're going to get a person who's almost like zero. So seven is seven. If the low end of the range is 50 and it's seven and somebody's down at five, these are people that, yeah, you can say they have the genes. We'll get to that part later. And, I, and I, I'm not one of those persons saying, oh, low glucagon, that corresponds to a particular gene. No, I look at clusters of genes. I look at groupings of genes to see if they're a problem. And it has to correspond to blood work. Otherwise, I don't treat it. I don't look at it. It's not that important to me. So, but if somebody is severely low, what I've seen is they tend to be also low thyroid. You know, they might be borderline. So they call that subclinical hypothyroid. Subclinical means that they have the symptomology of, but they may not have the blood work of. It might be low-ish. Things like Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Hashimoto's is an autoimmune hypo, underperforming thyroid. Generally, hypothyroid, if it's not autoimmune, it's just called hypothyroid. So that's how it's differentiated. But what I see is low glucagon, and I see people with thyroid problems, and this is a component, I see autoimmune antibodies to their thyroid as an independent number. Not everybody, most people do not have antibodies to their thyroid. And there's another test. You look at that. So my suspicions would be is that lipedema people would fit right into it. They would probably be, if not hypothyroid, they would be subclinical hypothyroid, and maybe it might be an autoimmune or not. My suspicions it would probably be autoimmune that had not been correctly diagnosed. How arrogant of me to say that, I understand. But this is my belief. And uh, these things can be tweaked a little bit. It's not just by cranking up your thyroid with the right medications over time. That is helpful, and it has to be watched. But we, we now we get into the question now that I'm talking about labs relative to lipedema, because it's one of the four things I look at. You have to ask, how did this happen? How did this person get to be so chronically low on glucagon? Right? So during a fast, you're not eating anything, right? You've gone at least 12 hours. Your glucagon should be normal, should be in the normal range. It start, should be the, the sugar. It should be making the sugar you're using to sleep through your night. And yet it wasn't. My thinking is, this is a person through the previous four decades before they met me or five decades of their life, they were a high carb, standard American diet person, high processed foods, and it wore them down. It wore them down because this processed foods is crunchy glucose, if you ask me. That's what processed food is, crunchy glucose. So it's potato chips, crunchy glucose. It's Captain Crunch, crunchy glucose. It's crackers, crunchy glucose. So they have been eating glucose all their lives. Their body said, I get it now. You're, you're an exogenous, right? You're taking it from the outside in. You're an exogenous. You're willing to be dependent on exogenous ketones. We're just going to stop production of endogenous glucose, which is from glucagon. So the glucagon just sort of atrophies. Whether it actually goes away, atrophies in the sense it stops working, I think it has worked so little and has been called upon to work so little that it just, the receptors, et cetera, et cetera, you can work backwards, become hypofunctioning. So once glucagon is hypofunctioning long-term, autoimmune then starts to knock off various other organs, endocrine organs specifically. So endocrine organs being the thyroid. So back to lipedema, those aspects of puberty, pregnancy, menopause, and then gynecological surgery all have to do with hormones, but primarily they have to do with estrogen. Okay, so what else do we know about estrogen? So I'm going to leave that panel away and say we take a lot of stuff, magnesium and all this other stuff. I mean, it's it's fun, it's interesting, and I really enjoy doing it, but I'm not going to go through that whole panel now, but you've got the gist of, I look for things that are related to each other that 
give me something to at least think about, if not immediately act on. So if I saw low vitamin D, I would act on it. You know, I don't need more information around their vitamin D. And then I would watch that, for example, okay? We now have ability, a person's ability is kind of has an impaired, a difficult time producing glucagon. So they're going to have a difficult time to produce their own blood sugar. So these are the kind of people they're going to have a very difficult time transitioning to a low-carb ketogenic diet or a very low-carb diet, low-carb, high-fat maybe, but they just don't have the backup. They don't have that, that alternative generator. We just moved into a house and it actually has a whole house generator. Can you imagine that? Never had that before. That means when we lose our power, it's going to kick on and it kicks on once a week just to do a thing called an exercise. But that's what glucagon is. It's that backup generator when you know, when the electricity, when you're not eating enough glucose, i.e. you're sleeping, you're on a very long hike or something like that, that it kicks on and you now have your glucose. And so that generator is always working whether it's used or not. And so these people, for whatever reason, have never had to turn on their generator and now it's going to be very problematic for them to be able to not feed themselves crunchy glucose. It doesn't have to be, or we'll say carbs. So for these people, and I've seen that, one person, one woman in particular, just couldn't drop her carbs. And it wasn't about mental discipline. You know, she actually got uh, tearful. She was, she would get depressed. She would get dizzy. She'd get these headaches. And so these labs said, oh my gosh, we need to start at a much higher level of carbs for her. And so that was very helpful for me to see. And then that was reproduced in a man in a whole different situation, but they both had thyroid and autoimmune issues together. And then it's grown from there. So that was the first aha. Okay, so now we go over to intracellular micronutrients. So we do a test. And there's a number of companies that do this. I use SpectraCell. I'm sure as other companies could be as good. But um, it gives me kind of a larger context of are you egregiously deficient in certain things that we can identify? So if you are deficient in certain things, at least it gives me something that I can bring up to normal. I'm not going to flood your system with what you're deficient. I want you up to normal functioning. Right? So think of these nutrient deficiencies that you've acquired. It could have been because you've been on certain medications. It could be because you had a poor diet. It could be because you've been on crunchy glucose all your life, right? AKA processed foods. So however you got there, you got there. And now we have to moderately, you know, we can see if we can get your carbs down. And we will in time, but we just, on you, we have to pace it much more slowly. So you can't go and talk to that 5 to 10% of the women in lipedema, and I've just made that up, I think it's a lot less, that said they got great results on keto. And you tried it, and you didn't, and you felt lousy. Well, I think that's actually more the norm. So you, you're going to have to drop comparison to what other people are doing but keto, as in dropping your carbs, is going to be part of your future. But we have to build a base camp. We have to make you healthy enough first so you can drop your carbs. So I do believe your glucagon will be able to come back online. That backup generator will be able to kick on with more regularity. But we can't just expect it out of the blue if it hasn't been kicked on for 40 years that it's going to work like it did. So I hope you're going with that analogies, those analogies I'm tossing out, um, because it is what it is. I, I, this is how I think, and it's not me making up pictures. This is how I believe it is. So now we found other things that may be unique to you that are deficiencies we can ask. That would be about a supplement. And again, we don't know how you got to this deficiency, but you just are. So now we removed, so it takes time. So I give it a couple months for that to sort of, because you go slowly. You don't go, I'm going to take a lot of this thing I'm deficient in, whether it's, let me just scoot down and see what I've seen, whether it's a lot of folate, vitamin E, zinc, or biotin, or, you know, you got to go slowly to bring it up so your body starts to realize gradually there's a new normal and you're going to start to feel good. Even though you don't look any different, you're going to start to feel a little better. Now you have fewer deficiencies. Makes sense, right? There's a logic to this. Again, as I say, there's nothing that I do that is unique. I'm just putting things together and I might believe I'm more thorough than anybody that I've talked to. People are uh, vast, and maybe they've copied my program. That's fine that they do. All right, so now we have that out of the way. All right, so now we did a uh, genomic 
analysis. And we have done it in a number of ways. We either had you go to 23andMe and download your raw data. And if you were a person said, I don't want to go through 23andMe because those results are public. Well, then we send you off to another company to go get your genome evaluated. And I'm not looking at every gene in your whole body. I'm looking about at 120 areas that are most likely to have a problem, right? So I look at those areas and those areas are even interconnected. Some do, like you might've heard of folate B12, that has to do with MTHFR or glutathione or NAC. Or, so we, I see that as a network. So we look at that. That's strongly associated with um, people who have this particular problem these particular four or five genes that are very closely related to each other, you know, with schizophrenia, depression, bipolar. So that's in there. You know, that's, does that mean if I address, and by the way, the reason I look for that, I'm not looking for a gene that I can't do anything with, right? So I'm not looking for BRAC1 or BRAC2, your breast cancer genes. I can't do anything about that other than generally protect you. But these are genes that require either usually higher levels of certain vitamins. So I can treat them. I'm one of those people, by the way. So I need to take higher levels of certain things on a, I don't like, and I don't even like taking supplements. So certain things I take nearly every day, but I don't take much. But I do believe in that and I think it's a big deal. So, and there are other areas that are like that too. So I look at these clusters, my words, of these genomic problems SNPs, singular nuclear polymorphisms. These are all pretty common. Now there's a lot of companies that do this analysis and they and they want you to buy their product. So either way, we get this mapping out of these particular 120. And now I say, what areas that can I address? And I have had people that come through the program that really don't have much in the way of problems. So there's nothing specific that I could address. Others are severe and they, it was two or three things that really had to be looked at and it did correspond to their blood work and it did correspond to some of their nutrient deficiencies. So now we're getting a kind of filled out context by saying in these particular people, these genetic problems made a difference, but these genetic problems can be treated. That's the thing. That's what we're looking. We're looking at what can be treated. What can I give that will make that problem feel like it doesn't exist? So I still have my problem but it's not a problem to live with. You follow? Okay. And so then the last one, back to the hormones, we do, it's pretty much a 24-hour urine specimen treatment, and that's through Dutch, which Dutch is dried urine comprehensive hormone test. And so what it does is that you pee on these little pads sequentially in the course of, it's really 22 hours, and you and there's specific times for you to do this, and then you, they dry out and you send them in and I get a nice map of how your day was relative to certain hormones. So people who have been dependent on carbohydrates, right? So they could be just like I've talked about people that had impaired glucagon and they really were dependent on what they could get in their mouth in terms of glucose, you know, and if they couldn't eat, they were a terrible person to be around and felt awful, depressed, headaches, and so on and so forth. So when you find people that have had sustained elevated, now we're speaking of pretty much pre-diabetics and diabetics, which many of us are and just didn't know that, have chronically elevated blood glucose, which means we have chronically elevated insulin, which means it drives other problems. And one of these other problems is for all of us who produce testosterone, and by the way, that's all of us, both genders, not just guys, that that hormone and there's a family called androgens in general, they get converted lickety split into estrogens and have almost no time in your body to express themselves as testosterone. Testosterone and estrogen are very, very similar molecules and it's just one step away. And so what we find is that people who have had uh, diabetics, people who have had chronically elevated glucose and insulin, they also have chronically elevated estrogens. And there's three different kinds of estrogen that we're getting into it. But let me just stop at the idea is that they're heavy on the estrogen. They're not on the um, on the testosterone side. And then the second part of that conversation, well, what kind of estrogens are they heavy in specifically? And that's another issue. Uh, so women, when they have a lot of estrogen 
it okay. then it, those are growth hormones of a of, of a type. So that adds to this, we if you will, predisposition to a person that may well develop lipedema. They could develop other problems as well. But so now it makes sense. If you start putting these things together, you go, wow, we actually can treat this. Now we've gone from blood work to intracellular nutrition to uh, looking at their SNPs, right? Their genome, their their problematic genomes, if they have some or not, that can be addressed as opposed to not just identified, but addressed and that may have been contributing to their situation. And then we look at the hormones. And to me, those four tests, those four panels are a lens if you squish them together and that's who you are. And in that, it's not perfect, right? Nothing is perfect. And in that, it gives us more clues to how then can we address you to move you from where you are, to remove that obstacle to cure. And we started this, the obstacle to cure. We're going to reach into that bucket of yours and going, yeah, I understand why the ketogenic diet is one of those big rocks. Let's take that sucker out. We take that rock out, but we find that you're one of those people that are low in glucagon and really can't do keto yet. So we got to put that rock back in. We can't touch that rock yet. We have to pull out some of the smaller ones. Some of the smaller ones would be those deficiencies. Then we come back and we go, you know, now it's time to gradually take the bigger rock out, which is the carbs, of course. We take the rock out and have you drop down your carbs. So how far would you eventually have to drop down your carbs? We don't know. We'll be watching you. You know, it could be down, I don't do carbs. So we just went through the holiday week, right? Did I have carbs? Yeah, we had crab cheese pie that we have every Christmas and New Year's, and there's some cheese in there. I hardly have any dairy, so we have that. There's some carbs in there, not many. So I'm a pretty low-carb to no-carb person, and life is fine with me. You know, I do not hear, as I started this podcast, do not hear that you need to jump to very low carb. I think that is an important component of your situation that has lipedema and you're the 50-year-old woman who's had lipedema for a couple decades, if not four decades. It's going to be part of the future, but it may not be the part that you can do right away. You have to get a base camp underneath that so you then can be going to the summit. So going to the summit in this metaphor is going to the ketogenic diet now that you supported yourself. So that's why in one way we are all different and it has to be looked at. But in one way we all do something similar. You know, if it ends up being in the keto-ish dropping the carbs, then that's a good thing. And I can't see how that is not going to be part of your future. It just would be impossible for many people to start it now, maybe even a couple of months, maybe even six months, or maybe even, you know, depending how much work they want to put into these other areas. But you have to look at those things. So when we hear and go to a conference, oh, you know, such and such has had good uh, results. What does that mean? Two patients out of 400 were successful and these two patients are going, wow, it is great. That's a miss representation of their outcomes. And that's often what you get at these medical conferences. Anybody can find one person who has done well under some of their protocols. But if we're looking at something that is a little more personal and long-term more likely to be successful with the most of people, then we need to be a little more thorough. So I hope to you who wrote this email now about a month or so ago, that this was helpful that this was an elaboration on lipedema, my approach to this, what I've discovered that I makes me even more committed to this would be helpful, but this is not a quick win. I mean, I had uh, ulcerated colitis and, and Crohn's, and I didn't expect in a week it would turn things around. I'm on solid ground, and I do believe other people could be on solid ground as well. All right, till next time. Happy New Year, everybody. Hi, this is Dr. Goldcamp. I just wanted to encourage you to send in your questions to drgoldcamp at ketonaturopath.com. Many of you have, and so what I've done with these questions that I've gotten back to most of the people I email, but some of the questions that were so good, and if they were overlapping to other questions, I would combine them and try to put that into the topic of a podcast, either via one of the micro topics that are covered in an interview. As you know, we cover a lot of topics in any given interview. 
or some of my own sort of reporting, if you will, on some of these issues. So please keep the questions coming. Feel free to send in an email and uh, I will get back to you. Stay listening, send in your questions, and I will definitely get back to you.